pragmatic utopianism to start yeah yeah so like okay my reading of it and correct me if i'm wrong on this um is that um utopianism is worth considering i think that's probably point zero right um and i think point number one is that ontological considerations are central to understanding the human existence um Point two is that personal and cultural transformations can lead to profound societal change. Um, I think the third point was that technological and structural changes are secondary to ontological change in terms of their capacity to create a utopian society. And then I think the fourth part is that an improvement in the human condition necessitates a shift in consciousness or a transformation in being. I think that's kind of the, the broad thesis that you lay out in the essay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I largely agree with a lot of those statements, actually. Um, there's a few points in there around, like, epistemology and, like, super rationalism that I find might have some problems inside of it. But, like, the broad thrust of the essay is, like, largely one that I agree with because it's very much a kind of uh, outlining the ideas that you think will take us to a better, you know, society um, that will create a more egalitarian, progressive world. Yeah, that's that's the goal, right? Yeah. Yeah, well, I could. I, I that's a great summary of the, I think the core tenets, and then there's kind of some. I suppose backing up kind of principles or added uh, views uh, that you talk about, like the wisdom of the super rational. But yeah, that's just kind of yeah. I think in in actual one, it's like that. It, it has a kind of a utopian start of saying simply that we, or, or kind of a, both a start and a conclusion that. Uh, what we could say is a radically better world. What I mean is that we can often imagine improvements, um, but some world that's kind of dramatically better in a way for ourselves and for society and for the world is possible. I mean, it's not certain, it may not even be probable, but it is possible. Um, and then, as you said, the main thrust is that that there's kind of what we could call the ontological um, considerations. What we mean by that, you know, because that's a mouthful and often not used outside of, uh, philosophy traditionally uh, is the kind of consideration of being, you know, of our consciousness. Uh, it th that area is kind of crucial, both crucial to realizing it. Uh, that's that that's kind of where the core action is going to happen, not in technology, and not maybe in what we could even call structure, which is, for example, you know, we could all own the means of production, you know, classically in Marx Marxist communist thought. That's a structural change. Um, and those things might still be important, just because it's not saying that in technology and structure are not important, but they're kind of secondary. And um, I, I kind of want to just take a moment about that to say that, for example, that, that, that why that's also sometimes hard in thought, even if it's like something we're going to come to that we both agree with, is that it seems to be a lot harder for us to imagine so just to take the example I always think of just for a moment here is of sci-fi. Um, so I imagine most listeners have read some sci-fi or watched some science fiction. Um, I, I've, I've read and watched quite a lot. Um, almost when you look at them, whether they're dystopian or more utopian, and yeah, there's many dystopian versions, but they mostly involve like technology changes. You know, the one I have to think of is Ian M. Banks. I don't know if people have read the culture series, which are incredible. But the fascinating thing is, is that even though they're like these incredibly advanced AIs that, you know, there's talk about things like sublimation, which is this kind of going to the spiritual plane, or I don't know, transcending into some other dimension. Basically, most of the, it's kind of space opera, like most of the people are acting like just ordinary human beings. They've got most of the faults or strengths or weaknesses. Their consciousness is not really anyway noticeably different from ours, but they have, you know, incredible technology. Um, and so you know, or, you know, we, we could think of, you know, Star Wars or whatever, you know, people, people, the, the things that people are acting out are kind of very much what we've acted out in opera in the 19th century, or we've acted out in the Odyssey or things for like thousands of years. And it's just somehow a lot easier for us seemingly to imagine these kind of technological leaps, to imagine flying cars, than it is to imagine like some kind of really shift in co consciousness or the way that we organize even society in, in an odd way. So the except, you know, and there are exceptions to this. That I think sometimes prove the rule. Like the classic one for me is like Ursula Le Guin, which I think that her actually as I get older and I get kind of more maybe 
further down the path, you know, I, I read more and more, even into the wisdom of earthy, this is actually quite a kind of a much richer and quite a profound meditation on, on kind of power and like the nature, you know, the whole end of that of like the, the Ged, you know, loses his power and, but you know, what is wisdom? What is the way to actually use these powers? And it's a lot, there's a lot less of like zapping people with your magical stuff. And it's, it's even quite, it's much more about almost this inner journey. Even the, the very first book is about him, kind of his pride and this, this whole issue of, of his kind of releasing his other, this kind of demon other into the world. But, you know, the most, the most, I think the most example, best example might be the dispossessed, which at least maybe is a bit more structuralist, but, you know, they're all living in this kind of socialist kibbutz on this planet, this kind of anarchist utopia. Um, you know, and that, but that's just really quite rare in most science fiction. I mean, there are famous utopian examples, Bellamy's, um, how we will, you know, how, um, how we will live and things in the late 19th century, this incredible bestseller. But mainly, even that was sort of a, a socialist technological utopia. So I think that there's just something to emphasize that while it's kind of obvious, maybe change in conf consciousness or being is really important and has happened in human history, we could point to. Seemingly, we've maybe particularly in the last in the last 200 years, where we've been very technologically dominated society, it's been so much easier to imagine that or even structural change like we're all going to be egalitarian and just own everything together and it's like but actually what would it look like a kind of a, a society of sages you know it would be it's difficult to actually imagine without it seem like kind of polyannish or, or a bit ludicrous you know a bit like everything's just perfect i think science fiction is like kind of a really good referent because like that's really kind of like our imaginings of different ways of being like literally manifest in literature and like i've read all the books that you actually mentioned like uh the culture series for those that don't know it's like uh it's basically a post-scarcity society which you know um super intelligence basically keep humans as pets and they're basically allowed to fulfill all of their goals in life and like self-actualize and do great quests and it's about the sort of dark corners of the society which is largely an anarchist society actually and Banks's universe and it's probably one of the first examples of like really well thought out post-scarcity society and probably one of the most developed ones actually yeah i guess the other one would be sort of like star trek which i guess is like sort of space opera predicated on humanity living in a post-scarcity socialist utopia which is on built on infinite energy at the end of the day and humanity is like evolved beyond its sort of base instincts and migrated beyond the sort of dickensian life on earth into a sort of post-scarcity stellar society that advances its values across the galaxy um it's a simplistic world but it's a it's one that inspired a lot of people in our field to uh yes to, uh, yeah and it's incredible i mean it's also i think it's it's kind of noticeable by the way in that series as well i mean we're just going to go off on a slight because I, I also yeah it's one of the great i mean it's one of the great certainly modern i mean it's up there is that the very first one consider flabas um is probably i think in my view you know i get controversial but probably at least as like a novel at least as a work of literature probably the, the richest but and partly because its protagonist is fighting on the wrong side is writing for this group who are kind of like about power and domination i mean it, it's this famous the Adirian war it's the, the this war where the culture you know actually has to fight quite seriously at the beginning and there's a bunch of them who don't want to fight and you just go like we're totally you know we're non-violent so we're just going to flee off to some corner of the galaxy um but I think why, why I mention that is that it, it's also the one where, in a way, there's the most ambiguity or complex moral complexity. Whereas in the others, just to say, most of the time, it's kind of like, it's quite clear, like the culture good, they're kind of intervening. There's only really this question, question of like, do you intervene in some other society or not to, you know, as a kind of to do good, to do good or not. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's, the point I would make about it, if I, if I, you know, just to reiterate it, is that while it's a great exploration of post scarcity, it doesn't really address this kind of obvious question, which is like, okay, so you've had thousands of years, but like most of the time, even if the culture people are kind of the, these kind of humans of the future, that they, they don't really fight each other, but they basically spend their time like in a hedonism. You know, a lot, a lot of the kind of culture spends its time basically having sex, <laughs> taking drugs, um, and kind of hand gliding. You know, just doing extreme sports. And because they've got backup to their mind, it doesn't matter if they die. You know, it's kind of it's it's, it's you're like really this is what you've done with 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 infinite energy. It's kind of just <laughs> take a lot of drugs. It's kind of it's a bit odd. 
and and at the best what you do is like the more serious members like they join this kind of contact and they go and try and make other societies better by intervening in subtle ways um in that um yeah so it's kind of it, it, it it's funny that I don't think it really managed to explore very much the the moral complexity and and it I even think the one there's another you know another episode just to go into where they kind of I don't think attitude to religion I think Banks I don't know whether he was an atheist or where he is but it's definitely an attitude to a spirituality or religion that's a bit kind of you know duh why would we why would we need that in the future where we kind of have end, internal life and and as you know could just have set can you know can have <laughs> <laughs> can I have as much sex as we want <laughs> it's it's kind of it's kind of like well there might be other things that are missing you know it, it is just notice <laughs> there is that there isn't a lot of people who've got a lot of meaning crisis in, in it you know um so yeah that's interesting and I think so that is to bring back is that I think we live in a in a world where in general at least in political theory the things that we just we go back to like the onlogical change or the change in being could be kind of central it isn't something that's very serious taken very seriously in like mainstream political theory um yeah i mean there's a kind of spiritual component to some of like banks's writing though like I mean, the minds themselves are kind of like bodhisattvas because they refuse to sublime or to take care of humanity and like allow them to self-actualize and there's like surface detail has a description of like the hells like the synthetic yes, hells yes. that people can live in. Like, so there is that kind of component to it. I think it just seems a bit of a kind of an anachronism in Banks's writing, because I think he probably was an atheist. I know he was certainly like a hardcore leftist, but um, going back to the sort of the uh, description, I mean, a lot of political theory is kind of grounded in the here and now. It's concerned with, you know, what is the ideal configuration of society in the presence of scarcity? And much of economics is basically predicated on the same problem. Right. Well, the economic problem is how do we divvy up the resources on Earth uh, in a so-called fair way and what fair would might actually mean. And that's pretty much all of political thought and economics right there. It's like, what is the definition of allocation and fairness in the presence of scarcity? And things are a lot more interesting in a post-scarcity world, but like a lot of our political philosophy just can't even conceive of that post-scarcity world and doesn't have a path to get there, obviously, because that's predicated upon advances in technology or changes in our entire structure of organization and uh you know that's why it's in science fiction not in political philosophy i guess yeah well i think i think so i think you're so right i mean that i mean yeah you know really on the money that there a lot of it is kind of comes down to fairness or, or justice a lot of the western political philosophy i just don't know I yeah, I kind of often try to explore. I'm not really an expert, but like, what is Eastern philosophy? Because I think that there's a there's a double meaning, by the way, of like we talk about kind of ontological politics or the politics of being or the politics of possibility, um, uh, uh, kind of at life itself. And there's a double meaning of the ontological politics because there's both a point that basically um, political thought, which focuses seriously on taking seriously that humans could evolve in their consciousness or in our culture. That's kind of point one that you're emphasizing is kind of core to the utopian point of view that we're setting out. Like if you take that seriously, then I think there are a lot more exciting and kind of even near term possibilities than there are, you know, or maybe, you know, in the post scarcity story. I mean, I think that, you know, one of the other things actually I just want to say again in the culture is a lot of the people in the culture don't seem that satisfied. I mean, they get to have, they get, as I said, they have kind of, they have drugs basically wired into their brain. They have, they have, they can go anywhere. They can do any sports or other activities they want, but many of them are clearly dissatisfied. Um, that kind of comes across, you know, or not, you know, they're not like really suffering, but they're not that like super happy or super, you know, well, it kind of, that's, that's kind of clear. There's, that's there. So I think there's a kind of first point of that if we take that seriously, that sets up the utopian. There's another point, which is, I think, also about the history of political thought in the West, which is that there's a much bigger inner interaction between our political thinking, the way that we think about politics and what's possible and the questions we ask and our view about the nature of reality. Now that and just to just to kind of spell this out, so that if you're not even interested in political philosophy, I say who cares? You certainly care 
ultimately, whether you don't like politics or not, you care about politics in the small piece sense, not about like party politics. You care ultimately about how our society runs. You, you know, whether you like it or not, that's something that you're kind of enmeshed in if you're a human being. And so just to emphasize, even if you might think I'm not interested in political philosophy, you're kind of influenced by it, whether you think it or not. We live inside the assumptions, the worldviews, the beliefs of long dead political philosophers that we may not have even heard of. Um, and so this kind of come back to this point though, is let's take Plato and, and the Republic, which is kind of the, the original, you might say the foundational text in Western political philosophy. And just very crudely, the Republic sets out this vision for the Republic for this kind of ideal society. To put it a bit crudely, it's run by these philosopher kings who, you know, in certain kind of ways that people find, you know, sometimes nowadays might find a bit disturbing, authoritarian, they sort of brought these kind of children of a certain kind who are, you know, destined to be philosopher kings are taken off, they have a special education. There's, it's quite a hierarchical society where they're these philosopher kings they are like completely committed to justice. There's a kind of vision of that they're these ideal beings and they kind of organizing this ideal society. And many people, including recently, you know, Karl Popper has criticized it as being almost this kind of also uh, kind of an ancestral tone for kind of authoritarianism and a vision and you authoritarian utopian visions, um, you know, leading to the Nazis or whatever, if you like. But to go back to it, what is, what is very interesting is that what is maybe not as noticed is whatever you think of the, the political philosophy, it's kind of very coincident with Plato's ontology in the classic sense of ontology of what he thinks is reality. So he has this idea of these kind of ideal forms. And this is the analogy for the political, like there is an ideal square, there's an ideal circle, there's an ideal, ideal version of X in some kind of I don't know, some not kind of other reality, but that our kind of our, our reality when we th see an actual square or we see an actual, you know, plate or dish, it's kind of somehow uh, related to this ideal form that is out there. And similarly, that applies to the political philosophy that there's basically this ideal form of a state of which we can then take our imprint to, to some extent. You know, the, the ideals are there. And maybe, you know, maybe Stephen's got some comments on that. But what I, why I want to emphasize is his view about the nature of human beings and about the nature of reality really inform his vision about society. So, for example, you know, this idea that people are perfectible or the way or the limit, what, what's deficient in, in human beings, what will be corrected via this education that he discusses in some detail in the Republic, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so whether we, whether we maybe notice it or not, um, it's there. I mean, just to, to give one last example, modern economics, which we just mentioned, and kind of political philosophy, which are quite entwined, you know, crudely, humans are rational, they are utility maximizers, they are maybe selfish in some way, you know, although there's kind of some altruism or whatever. But, you know, there's this kind of view of human beings that informs how you then design uh, your institutions and systems. I agree with some of what you said, like definitely like the critique about um, Plato basically outlining an authoritarian society. Like, I mean, basically in the Republic, he outlines that like basically people are like cut out of like, you know, bronze, silver and gold and that the gold people are like destined to rule. And like, it's, it's really like horrible philosophy, actually. Like, and yes. <laughs> I think it's best relegated to the past because I don't think most modern thinkers about society would conceive of like, there's an ideal form of, you know, the government or the state um, I think most political philosophy, which I mean, rooted in like the post enlightenment, so like Rousseau and Locke and Hobbes and um, Rawls, I think would probably say that the ideal form of the state simply doesn't exist, that we're all just sort of muddling through and trying to find structures that work. Um, and that this conception to the sort of Platonic ideal of the state is actually kind of a dangerous one. I mean, and broadly speaking, I, I agree with the sort of largely the state has a legitimate purpose to exist. Like I believe in the program of liberalism, reason, democracy, rationalism, and that the core idea of the enlightenment is basically uplifting, you know, society out of the sort of Hobbesian, Dickensian pit and creating prosperity and abundance. And if you look at the sort of broad arc of human history, that has, that program has been largely successful, not, you know, perfectly successful, but like far more so than anything else that's ever been tried. And I think the, the sort of the conversation we're talking about is like I prescribe to a sort of view called like Burkean progressivism, which might be seen as sort of contrasting to like pragmatic utopianism. And like I believe that um, 
improvements in society should be achieved through evolutionary methods rather than revolutionary methods. And like this comes from a bit of the sort of the conservative thinker like uh, Edmund Burke, who wrote about uh, critique of the French Revolution, about how this was a very you know, highly destructive revolutionary process that ended um, a lot of <laughs> the state and society and resulted in a lot of bloodshed and horrors. And that kind of thing is the thing that we should try to avoid. By progressivism, I also mean that like, um, we should probably define terms here, like progressivism is, means that we should not have any kind of disposition towards structures in the past. And that yes. society should have a disposition toward improving itself over time. There should be no preference for those things in the past, which I largely agree with. But I also don't think that completely and rapidly and recklessly abandoning structures that have worked in the past is necessarily the best idea. So no disposition toward things in the past or institutions of the past, but a respect and a wisdom for the reasons that they were built in the first place. Um, I guess that would contrast with like conservatism, which has like an utter regard for yes. the institutions of the past. And you know, the past is like the ideal form where we should live. You know, I, I think that's ultimately about the Roman Republic. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No. So I mean that's where I set like um. But I'm also sort of a capitalist realism. Like, I think that largely, like, like this is the philosophy of like Mark Fisher. It says, you know, famous quote, like, it's easier to imagine the end of capitalism, uh, the end of the world than it is to imagine the end of capitalism. Um, that, we like, were critiquing it at the time. He was trying to say- <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. No, but he was, it was a critique. The comment originally was from a, yeah, a kind of critique of like, that we can't imagine ourselves outside of it. That's why we're entrapped in it. But yeah, I can. I, yeah. That we can't even conceive of like an ontology in which capitalism is not the supreme structure that governs our markets, right? Or well, our allocation but, of resources. But this is where I want to come in because I think this, this, so this is why this is a great discussion. I mean, I think because these two, so, so first of all, I want to say I have a lot of respect in a way, you know, for, for it um for like let's say pragmatic um let's say um they don't not pragmatic utopianism but i think um pragmatic progressivism in a way like or kind of we could say um, and, it, and both our viewpoints i think are progressive in the sense of both people we're both we're not neither of us are conservatives in the sense or reactionaries of wanting to go back to a past um uh, i think the thing that's worth exploring is for me the point I made about Plato was also true, let's say, about Hobbes or Locke or even, I would say, rules. It's less kind of obvious in rules writing. In a sense, it's just like the water you're swimming in. But basically, this water, what water are we swimming in when we imagine our state? Because political philosophy often has this focus. Funny enough, you know, federal thing of political philosophy is like, basically, what's the organization of the state? What, you know, classically in political philosophy, you know, will be like, you know, there's, you know, there's a breakthrough in Montesquieu, there's a de loi, because we, you know, we have the, the tripart division of, you know, the judiciary, the parliament and the executive or things like that. And these are things which I think are val clearly valuable. Um, but in my terms, I would say they're structuralist. They're, they're structural changes. Um, or, you know, are we going to be redistributive? You know, the rules, you know, you know, why should we have a lib modern liberal redistributive democratic state in which we have social welfare and things like that? You know, these things are really valuable, let me be clear. But I guess that I think they, they come from, funny enough, I think they come from a cultural and ontological context, which was what actually drove, drove them and which they also sit within. They live within a water, you know, they're the fish within a water. Uh, of of how, what human beings are like, and obviously the famous example is is kind of Hobbes, who, um, although in fact in some ways a conservative or even a, re a bit of a reactionary, is also a kind of, in some ways also a founding figure of, I guess, Enlightenment political modern modern political philosophy, but you know, ho ho to, to again caricature Hobbes, the famous like life in a state of nature is nasty, brutish, and short. Um, I mean that's the actual quote, but like it's a caricature of the richness of, of the Leviathan. There is an assumption about human nature in, in Hobbes. Um, there's, an, there's an assumption about um, what we would be like in a state, quote unquote, a state of nature, just as there is then in Rousseau, you know, the famous, the, the famous dichotomy is that, you know, Rousseau is like kind of in a state of nature, we'd all just be like perfect. And it's like, you know, the society that corrupts us versus Hobbes is like, well, we just kill each other. And it's what society is what, you know, brings law and order, protects us from our basic instincts, you know, means I don't just, you know, 
steal from my neighbor or go out raping people or whatever like there's all these rules and, and there's an order and there's a sovereign that prevent this war of one you know all against all and i to kind of bring this through i think you've the thing that for me is the kind of classic insight just to kind of if you're living in that assumption of that's what human nature is or that human nature is something that human nature is kind of permanent and is like something which is itself an assumption about human nature, then the kind of political logic follows. And then you can have a debate about like structures and which are better structures, you know? So Mar Marx doesn't really, in a way, Marx is kind of a Rousseauing in the sense he's like, oh, it's the society that crops if only had the right structure. And I disagree with that also really strongly. I'd be like, no, no, it's, I mean, it, do it does have some shaping, but it's kind of like it, you know, human nature is also not Marx ideal like you thought. It's it's more complex than both of those thinkers. And the example I just want to bring up is, let's say, Buddhism I, I, as a different view. And I always remember this. I was an economist. I was an economist at the University of Cambridge for a while. And obviously, economics 101 is like, we've got unlimited wants, unlimited resources. This is the problem. You know, we're going to have to try and solve the best problem. we can. Yeah. But it's also an assumption about human nature that we have unlimited wants. It, right built into economics is an assumption about what is our nature as humans. And if you look at Buddhism, and this, I was in, I was becoming a Buddhist or at that time in my 20s. And in Buddhism, you know, Buddhism 101 is the Four Noble Truths. So we kind of put it, you know, truth one is that there is suffering, the existence of suffering. Truth two is, um, the, the, the sources of suffering, that the source of suffering are kind of attachment and craving and a variety of things, hatred and delusion, the three poisons. And the third noble truth is that there is a path to well-being. There is a path to the transcendence of suffering. It, it kind of that is possible. And the fourth noble truth is the eightfold path, which is the path that leads to the end of suffering. And I mean, very again, caricature Buddhism, but whereas like Econ 101 says, look, you've kind of got these wants. The way to get happier is to keep satisfying more and more of your wants. You know, get a bigger house, get a bigger car, uh, be more successful, um, have more food, of which there's clear truth. You know, if you're starving or whatever, um, that's very much true, you know, that having more food is going to make a real difference. Or if you have no shelter or many things have been true throughout history or famine. But Buddhism says, look, we're not saying that stuff it, that there isn't important, that having food isn't important, but ultimately the true path out of suffering is to kind of reduce your wants in some way and not reduce them and say like, oh, I want less food today, but in a profound sense of your wants, for example, your the, the want in us to never die, even though we will, this, this body mind will dissolve at some point that you can, um, you can kind of, transcend those aspects of our kind of ourselves it, you know that and transcend does not mean exclude them they're still there we will still have pain we will still but there's things so what i'm why i'm bringing up is if you're in that world view then you'd be like oh wow we should be dedicating most of our energy society to maybe transforming our cravings transforming our our kind of our the craving in us uh, you know, that will generate the most growth in well-being and utility. Whereas in a classic kind of, you know, I think Western modernist way of thinking, it's like, no, no, these are just part of us. We're always going to want more, you know, and not die and things like that. And the way to do it is to work out ways to cryogenically freeze ourselves or to just have even more food or even more sex or even more stuff. And, you know, so I just kind of contrasting how if you were in a quite a different view about the nature of human beings, like the Buddhist one, you'd have quite a different view about what you'd focus energy on as a society. There's a lot there I actually agree with. I mean, basically your, your analysis that like the presuppositions that underlie economics and Western political thought, which have produced largely, you know, like the American society is probably the most canonical example, which is a hyper-individualistic consumption-based, uh, let's turn the infinite hedonic treadmill up to the maximum state, and uh, basically samsara in Buddhism. Basically, Americans export their culture, which is samsara, <laughs> um, which is not a, not a necessarily false analysis of what's going on there. And uh, I am not a Buddhist myself, but I mean, I... I can sympathize with the thought, but I think you can derive the same sort of 
assumptions from just an understanding of like natural selection, like natural selection favors for discontent and like uh, individuals exactly. never fully satisfied if they're going to strive for more resources, status and reproductive success, which is what you know evolution has optimized our brains to do. Um, and, you know, that th those traits may have benefited us in the past in the state of nature, but in sort of a modern industrial information economy, they just result in suffering and samsara and contemporary life is incompatible with an infinite hedonic treadmill. Like this, even like the culture series, for instance, like where people can literally just have infinite amounts of you know sex and drugs and everything. Like they're still discontent. And like discontent is always going to be part of yes. the fundamental like uh, essence of human you know, existence if we don't learn to change our perspective about like what is the get off the infinite hedonic treadmill, if you will. Um, so I can sympathize with that from just a pure naturalistic, rational perspective. Like you can come to the same conclusions as Buddhism. Um, yeah, and your your entire thesis is basically like crudely is that you think that there's like this is a debate whether like politics is upstream from culture or culture is upstream from politics, and you want to say like the ontological sort of primacy of being is actually upstream from culture as well, and then we should address the presuppositions in our philosophy that give rise to the culture. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, I'd, I'd say, by the way, culture is kind of collective being, so I wouldn't distinguish individual ontology and culture as I as see. much, though, that, though that they are suddenly intertwined, like our kind of, yeah, I mean, we could just, we, if we really went into, we can dive into that, but I'd say exactly, cult, I mean, of course, by the way, things are a circle, like, let, let me give, um, let me give a classic example I think is really uh, influential for me and like I think really powerful in this story in terms of like scientific evidence, which is the recent work on cultural evolution by people like Joe Henrich. Uh, at Harvard. I read his book, uh, The Strange People yeah. in the World. It's great. The, the Weirdest People in the World. And I, I think I've done, we've actually done, a, I've done a whole series, uh, interview series with him because I just think, let me give one example in there I think that just spells out some of the kind of political theory logic that I have is so, to again simplify a kind of argument in the weirdest people in the world is okay for some reason early christianity catholic in the early catholic church gets these kind of views about um that they kind of come these views about cousin marriage and about marriage and about um marriage practices that are quite unusual in basically the history of humanity and um what he calls the the kind of marriage and family program of the Catholic Church, and which come from basically spiritual slash religious views. They're not grounded in it. They're not, they're not, they're not like, oh, we should do this to improve our society. They kind of come from like, this is what God wants. And one of the things God wants is that you don't have multiple wives. You marry one person. Um, that, by the way, is pretty unrare in like history of most human societies. I think Henry says like 90% of all human societies that we have data on in, in you know, from hunter gatherers to modern are like 90% of them are polygonous. Um, which means that they allow men to have multiple partners and, and sometimes women, but, but mostly men. Um, it, it bans cousin marriage. It bans marrying. If your wife dies, you can't marry her sister. There's a whole bunch of practices. They're actually very standard in human history. And this has this huge kind of impact on... So this is this sort of kind of a cultural view, like a cultural set of views and values for religion, turn into an institution, if you like, which then turns into kind of laws. Like you can't do... You can't do certain things. You know, it, it's illegal to marry your cousin and things like that, which then has this kind of ultimately, he would argue, has this kind of, again, like a cultural effect, which is that basically you you it, you destroy kinship networks in the way they traditionally work because you can't knit together kinship groups in the same way because that requires cousin marriage and some of these practices. Basically, you you start having forming a, rather than having a kinship network which is has a lot of vertical ties like i'm related to my father my father's kind of in charge of what i do um and things like that you have a much more horizontal set of relationships developing so you have a much more horizontal culture um that's much more democratic and he, you know he kind of basically argues that this is the birthing of, of why western society becomes the way it is becomes weird um and and then for also actually very successful because it turns out that democracy and individualism and it's kind of crucial to you know science and reason and the age of reason and so on so just to give just to kind of spell that out you have a set of views and kind of ontological views or views about what god wants and about the nature of reality that lead to a bunch of institutions that then form further people's being um 
you know, down to the, down, you know, in, in, in actually kind of ways that our brain actually work or neurotransmitters, you know, our, the brain is actually wired, which then lead to further kind of institutional or cultural um, or technological changes. And that, you know, so, so it's a kind of, it, it's a complex interdance of these factors, I want to emphasize. But there is this crucial point there in that story that kind of being or views about the nature of reality or views about how we should, you know, who human beings are and how we should operate kind of came first in some way. Yeah, that's a good summary of uh, Henrik's book. It's been a while since I actually read the book, but like largely he's making the argument that a lot of like Western Anglo-Saxon um, Judeo-Christian derivative culture has these kind of presuppositions baked in that ultimately create institutions that lead to atomism and sort of very weird behavior by historical standards that like most cultures throughout history have not exhibited like the behaviors that the the church introduced and these are producing some very very strange um, societal manifestations right yeah I largely I mean as a uh, to say uh, I grew up in a like very, very conservative Christian upbringing. So like the more that I understand sort of the, the fish, the water that I was swimming in when I grew up and, and the more I kind of undo that thinking, um, <laughs> broadly speaking, the happier I am. So I, I largely agree with a lot of that. Uh, just to say, things. that's true in terms of core, hardcore Christianity, but it's like, yeah, just to emphasize things that maybe people haven't read the book. I mean, just in, there's incredible, you know, for example, Western societies, um, have like some of the highest levels of stranger trust in the world. Um, I w the level at which we would trust people we haven't met or we don't know or don't know through our family is higher than almost any other societies in the world. Um, we obey abstract rules. Like we will cheat, funnily enough, countries in like Western Europe and the US cheat less in, in situations where no one can observe them. Yeah. Um, I mean, the famous couple is actually like, first of all, kind of structured psychological experiments where people go and roll a dice they have to say what dice roll they had and if it's like a six they get money and so obviously there's no one knows whether they actually got a six they just self-report yeah but you can then statistically work out how many people were cheating because you know how many sixes should have been rolled if you do this with a thousand people and they find that you know people in the west uh for some reason lie less on average than almost anywhere else in the world and it's because god is watching you the, the argument is that you had this model uh, particularly in Protestantism, where, you know, God knows what you're thinking. It's not just what you do outside. It's God knows whether you're being cheating or lying or being dishonest. Um, and this is true also of Islam. Just to be clear, this many religions have some aspect of this. For example, there's a fascinating study. He also reports that, I think they did a study in, in maybe it's Marrakesh, but like basically what happens when you haggle with someone in a bazaar when the minaret is, when the, when the muzoin is chanting the call to prayer. So when you're hearing some reminder that you're, that you're a Muslim and what that means to be a Muslim, you're less likely to try and rip someone off basically. He's actually, they've actually yeah. got a study like this. Um, so there's a really powerful effect of religion on our behavior and being, and even on the wiring of our brain. Why, why I go into this though, is that it tells me it tells you a couple of things for political kind of philosophy, I think. So one is that actually focusing on culture and actually focusing on things that look like religions, frankly, uh, you know, which you could include even modern day science in that, we can get into that debate, but basically strong belief systems and frameworks have a really profound effect on who we are. And maybe in a, a secondary, which is even more relevant to political philosophy, into the size of the group of people that we will trust or even die for. So basically, it, it, one of the things you're interested in maybe in political philosophy and in particularly utopian is like, how do we care for more people? Over human history, we seem to have enlarged the zone of concern that we have. We do seem to have gone from maybe just caring about my family to my kind of extended kinship network to kind of my tribe to even a nation um you know etc so we seem to have enlarged our zone of concern and that that has happened in large part because of change in culture and then in maybe our nature you know like actually in our genes and things like that so or increasing abundance as well yeah that we can actually have the resources to care for more people 
Right. Although I, I think that that's probably, a, I, I don't know, like that's a good example. I don't think that's probably actually that relevant. I think that the abundant, I think if anything, the direction of causation is the other way around. I, we've got two variables and I would suggest it's like the fastic does, 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 uh, does kind of capitalism cause democracy or does democracy cause capitalism uh, debates? But just to take, you know, we could take a couple of examples. Another one from Henrich there, just to answer that question. No, there's a group called the Ilahita, which he talks about quite a bit in the weirdest people of the world, which is this tribe in Papua New Guinea. And they've been studied a lot because they basically got really big uh, relative to most gather 100 tribes. Most of them are like under 300 people and they're like 3000. And there's been this kind of extensive study of them. And what they kind of found out was essentially um, at one point there was this other tribe that was aggressively expanding. And they were like, shit, you know, we are going to get wiped out by these guys. Like, what is, what's going on? Why are they so good at fighting? Like, what's happening? Like, the elders got together and kind of roughy, you know, like, oh man, they must have some really powerful gods. They must have some really powerful stuff going on. We're going to go and kind of like steal it. You know, we're going to go and find out what their gods are. And we're going to cop, you know, we're going to take them on, even though they're not our gods. And what happened was they did this. Um, and they even kind of, what's even funny is they kind of screwed up. They they kind of like miscopied some of the practices and rituals and gods of this other group. But in doing so, they basically made them from a functionist perspective more effective because what they really created was a whole bunch of initiation rituals and gods that were shared across groups, um, kinship groups within the tribe. Because normally what happens is the, the tribes kind of fracture at a certain size because there's like different families. They end up in a fight and then they, they kind of, they just move off and they go off somewhere else. One of them goes off somewhere else. And these practices knitted the group together. So it's an example where they were scaling their sense of identity and their, their size of their tribe. And they ended up then being able to fight off this other group, by the way, um, out of a, a kind of change in their religious beliefs. And so, you know, to go back famously to, again to Christianity, Christianity was sort of radical because it was also like everyone, everyone is included if you are a Christian, um, if you are a Christian, but everyone is then part of, you know, part of the church. Um, that's quite, that was quite a, quite a novel kind of model and quite an egalitarian model at the time um, as well. And obviously came very egalitarian again in Protestantism. So just, I, I want to kind of come back to you, but I just want to say like, this is worth exploring. Do you think it's that because we've got richer that we care for more people? Is it that we because we kind of care for more people that we got richer? Ooh, that's a profound question. I mean, I think it goes back to like a fundamental question about like human nature. Are people intrinsically good? Do we want to care for each other or are we fundamentally uh you know self-interested, sort of rational actors that are optimizing for our own? like survival and reproductive fitness. And I, broadly speaking, fall into the fact that people are intrinsically good so long as they have a certain level of abundance. And below that, I think things kind of do descend into, um, but like Hobbes would describe as the state of nature, the nasty brutish in short. And um, I think the broad arc of both capitalism, liberalism, and democracy, which, you know, as Henry noted, arises a little bit out of the sort of philosophical underpinnings of Christianity, where you have this conception of like the ideal thing, which I guess is God or platonic forms um, and the construction of high trust societies, which are conducive to capitalism, obviously, because if you can trust people and write contracts and have the rule of law, then that gives rise to, you know, <laughs> you know, large amounts of economic development and structures that can produce debt and, you know, society and capitalism, and capital markets, and then <laughs> venture capital and tech and everything. Um, and that's the foundation that we live on. Um, but I do think that the broad arc, like capitalist realism is a philosophy that's meant to undermine itself by producing a society of abundance, where by, you know, we could basically like Marx could never have written Das Kapital unless he happened to live in a society like Germany at the time that was producing such abundance that somebody could write at home, basically deconstructing the society that created the abundance, right? <laughs> And so I think yeah, ultimately, he wrote it in like, the British Library. I mean, he, he lived in yeah. Germany, but oh, sorry, yeah. the British Library. Yeah. So like, I by think my broad he view was, is that cap was a capitalism. It was a capitalist. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Marxist capitalist roots. Yeah. I mean, I think capitalism is largely the bootloader for a more enlightened, post-abundant society that our children will probably inherit. Um, and there's some presuppositions baked into that. 
but like I think that the broad arc of the ideas of rationalism, the Enlightenment, um, and market economies on long time scales produce abundance, and abundance allows us to extend the locus of concern and compassion to more beings. Okay, so, so, well, and this is a point we we could explore a bit. So I would my hypothesis would be a bit like I, just to be clear, like to reiterate. Sorry, first, I want to reiterate a caveat, which is, like I said before, any causal um, discussion is, it's an ecology of causes. Something causes there, like, you know, culture and being influence institutions or structures, which influence technology and technology influences being. And, you know, there's, there's, there's a complex chain and they all cause each other in some way. But we are trying to discuss kind of what's maybe more primary. You know, the metaphor I have to like to think here is this metaphor that McGilchrist has about your hemispheres. You need your left and your right hemisphere. Um, both of them, you need you, you need both of them, but maybe one of them should have primacy in how you see the world. Um, maybe it should be the right hemisphere or the left hemisphere. So I think the thing I would say here is I would say that Henrich's point for me suggests more like a cultural change led to more cooperation. I basically stuff that was in Christianity led to the elimination of kinship networks, which led to more horizontal um, need for horizontal connections and therefore trust. And also attitudes like God is watching and other things that were there, but without maybe the level that there is in Islam, you know, like there was kind of both freedom and an internal kind of, you know, I should be honest because otherwise I'm going to be, you know, go to hell. Um, those things more were the basis on which, you know, reason um science democracy built and then they reinforced those things now I, the, the, but so i would say that i would be more like the causative chain is that there were things leading to our enlargement of our zone of concern which then because basically solving collective action problems um which include things like enforcement of contracts collective action problems like enforcement of contracts funding science um, you know, having peace, you know, just, you know, in, at least within a certain state boundary, even if you're fighting other states, load of things like that um, were, be, were, you know, were things that caused then the abundance that's happened rather than, and the, so it was kind of in, in large zone of concern caused abundance. And of course, abundance then supports that in large zone of concern. I think I also agree with you that if we go back to a really anarchist situation where everyone's fighting each other in a terrible way, we would lose a lot of our care for, you know, maybe a care for others. So I'm not saying it isn't a part of that, but I think the kind of primary cause is a bit more like we in large zone of concern, which led to growth and abundance. Um, and I want to kind of, you know, but the, so I did, we could come back to that debate, but I think it's an interesting, a really interesting question. But I wanted to build on on something you were maybe else you were saying, which is, I think my view often that I that's also built into the ontological politics is, hey, kind of modernity's run its course. <laughs> so and, and and that and modernity was amazing, you know, like like in a way agreeing with what you're saying, which is. It built the scaffolding. It, it kind of built the ladder, which we no longer maybe need. Um, it, like it's not that we won't want still want technological progress. We won't want more material or food for everyone in the world. But we already have actually probably enough food for everyone in the world. We just don't distribute it very well. Um, but you know, of course, I would like even more. I'd like to. I'd like to. You know, I don't know. Zoom around the galaxy and <laughs> whatever it is. <laughs> but that at the same time. Um, there are kind of issues, there are both issues being caused by things of modernity and that maybe we don't need it as much anymore. And the analogy I'd I sometimes would use here is like, if we think of the late last great transition in, I would say kind of cultural ontological terms, which was the birth of modernity. And if you're sitting there, let's say, let's say you and I, we zoom back to the time of Thomas Aquinas, Stephen, and it's like, I don't know, 1250, and we're sitting there having this, we're not having a pod, we're not doing a podcast because we're exchanging letters by scroll or something. But, you know, or we're sitting in the monastery together. We mean like, you know, things are pretty good. Like, wow, you know, this is the high middle ages. There's actually been lots of technical technological progress that won't be reached again for another three, 300 years, actually. Um, you know, food has been growing. We're building these incredible cathedrals. Um, you know, learning is developing. And, I think my thing would be like, oh, it's what, you know, Catholicism, you know, there's a, a Christianity across Europe, you know, we think that things are working quite well. And 
what I would suggest is like, yeah, they were working quite well, but they're, we're about to go on the Renaissance and birth the next culture. And so my question, let's say today, would be like, yeah, like the obsession, you know, there are certain clear issues maybe with capitalism's kind of growth mindset. You know, there's clear ecological issues with that, like Absolutely. we're just going to consume and eat more. Um, there are clear, um, I think, issues in like let's say nationalism so one of the great successes i think of modernity was growing my concern for like a whole nation i went from my village to caring about all english people or all french people or all you know taiwanese people or all you know i don't know russian people or whatever it was that's a huge achievement um actually you know in that growth but it's also led to then those groups finding each other even more you know, in, in even some of those more destructive ways than we did before. So I think what I guess I would I'd ask you is, I think rationality has been amazing. I think the the enlightenment has been incredible. I think um, you know capitalism has been amazing. And I, I this question to you: Do you think that maybe it's kind of run its course? That there's that there's there's a there's a need for us to kind of not unless you throw away but go beyond like include those things that we got from them not throw out reason but as we talk actually in the essence the super rational is it time for us to include reason but also go beyond reason in some ways is it time for us to go beyond growth uh in some ways is it time for us to go beyond secularism in some ways those are profound questions um I'm sort of playing my sort of epistemological cards here, but there, like, there is nothing beyond reason. Um, <laughs> reason is all there is. Um, I think that there are frameworks for, I say I would bracket sort of things into sort of two ontological categories. There's like understanding and knowledge and there's sort of sense-making. And sense-making can be things that are more fuzzy sort of ways of conceptualizing aspects of human existence that cannot be tied to rationalism. And I'm finally totally fine with people incorporating that into their sort of ways of being. And that includes things like religion, um, sort of axiomatic assumptions. So like I have an axiomatic assumption, I think broadly speaking, uh, more awareness leads to more compassion, but I can't rationalize this in terms of any kind of um, presupposition. I think it's just axiomatic to my belief system. Um, I think it's also tenet of Buddhism as well, by the way. Um, so I think there's plenty of those things that can exist and they can exist in harmony with rationalism because they're incommensurate with each other. Like they don't try to rationalize their existence in terms of other presuppositions. But I think under ways of understanding the world, understanding um, society have to be done sort of in a rationalist framework because otherwise, and this is where maybe I take a little bit of an issue with some of the things in the article about the super rational. I think that any non-rational process we draw on requires some form of epistemic justification to be considered reliable. And like I think that's the kind of uh contradiction I see at the heart of the like pragmatic rationalism one is that there's no actual reason to actually uh incorporate super rational thinking into um a description about how the world should be, like making normative claims, right? I don't think you can incorporate super rational assumptions into um normative claims about how the world should be um so maybe that's kind of getting really into wonky philosophy you, stuff you, but you like, spell that out. just just say that again so you say you can't incorporate like super rational claims into kind of like normative claims about how the world should should be, be. So, yeah like so, so things so let's just distinguish like by rational we mean things like somehow objective or that we can all agree on through our reason or through science or through empirical investigation where super rational things that we can't do that about like the existence of God or something like that. I think those can only inform how you should be. Yes. Yeah. But that that's what, just, first of all, just distinguishing rational from super rational, like rational stuff that we kind of, is that an objective or that we can kind of do empirical work on that we can all agree on. And like super rational things that like, like the existence of God that we can't, we're not going to be able to prove empirically yeah. one way or the other. Things that exist independent of the mind. And that they can be conceived of independent of one mind would be objective truths. And those have to be justified true beliefs. Um, and I think there's a lot of things that can exist, or it's a lot of the space of human thought. Um, the superset is things that are not rational or justified true beliefs. Um, and those are kind of super rational. And I think those things can exist and they can exist as part of one's worldview. 
but they can't inform an objective understanding of the world. Does that make sense? Yeah. Well, I think the thing. So, first of all, I should let reiterate my question, which is to you. I think so. I think this is really interesting. I want to keep exploring. I just want to check. So, it was like my question was like, let's say the analogy is we're seeing there in the high middle ages. That moment, we're in, we're in the kind yeah. of we're swimming in the water of like Catholicism, and things are like going pretty well in twelve fifty. And we sit there and we say, well, you know, like hey, you know, like metaphorically, like capitalism today, we're like it's going pretty well. You know, you know, feudalism's working quite well. You know, look, you know. Agriculture output is up. Um, you know, look at the look at the innovation. Look at the cathedrals we're building. I mean, they're like incredible. Um, and you know, also our kind of way of thinking, like you know, uh, Christian. I guess you call it like you know, I know it's kind of the the high middle ages. So it's kind of philosophical Christian thought is is reaching its apogee with Thomas Aquinas. You know, we're like, wow, you know, look at that. This is incredible. I'm saying like metaphorically, we're sitting here saying like, you know, capitalism is pretty good. Rationality is pretty good um um you know secularity is pretty good you know that was a big breakthrough that we kind of got religion out of the state um etc you know religion is a private personal matter now it's not something that etc do you those are kind of like i would say kind of key tenets of the enlightenment you know yeah um key, key kind of assumptions they're even what do we swim in um Would you, what I guess I was asking is, do you think like you were mentioned, like at least with capitalism, maybe we're kind of going to transcend it. You know, we're going to, it's got us to somewhere and then we're going to be in this super abundant place. We won't really kind of need it in the same way anymore. You know, we'll move. Yeah. But do you think that we, that any of those kind of viewpoints, like we might still incorporate them. It's not like we're going to get rid of reason, but we might kind of have something which is super rational, which includes it, but like the circle gets bigger metaphor, you know, you know reason was everything that was important or true about the world and we might be like oh no there's this other stuff and it, and and i think the key point we're saying here is it's not just that there's other stuff that you have personally there's other stuff that is kind of shared societally as kind of beliefs you know because that's i think the, the key point is at the moment reason is in under the enlightenment reason became the sole thing that like as a collective we agree on you know things that can be proved through reason that, that yeah. we can kind of prove scientifically those you know things that and you know you saw it in the covid pandemic you know like the sense making broke down where you're like oh there's a whole bunch of people in our society who aren't listening to the scientists who you know for what, whatever we think of that i won't get into that debate right now but you know you can see these moments where epistemological agreement as a society like what what is truth how do we decide what we what what is correct or true and what and therefore what we should act on is like really important and so i guess that my question to you is do you think we're are any of these kind of key assumptions in alignment going to be kind of transcended in the way that we transcended the assumptions of the high middle ages like we're like oh you know feudalism is useful it worked in some ways but we've got a better system um that you know replaces it um I largely believe, I think this, maybe this is where we have like a fundamental disagreement. I believe in like the primacy of reason as like upstream from pretty much all other thought. Although I don't think it's exclusive that it defines the entire realm of human thought. I think that there are other things that we can yes. conceive of, but like you're describing this, the phenomenon of like qualia. Can there be kind of like shared qualia? Can my experience of love be the same as your experience of love? I think these are fundamentally like unknowable propositions. So maybe they could be, or maybe we could agree that they are, but we can't actually know it. Um, like, can I know that you're conscious or you know, they're not some sort of zombie or something? You know, like, uh, no, I can't know these things. You can talk about them, but I think fundamentally they can't really inform structural shifts in society because there's no way of knowing the veracity of these claims. Like that which is that we cannot name should not be spoken of, I guess, would be kind of what like Wittgenstein would say of these things, right? Well, the thing I'm trying to get at though is that I mean, first of all, I think there's a book we could read, we could maybe read that would uh, maybe you've read, but the, the, this book by Ian McGilchrist called The Matter with Things. Um I've read The Master and His Emissary. You read the Master and His Emissary. Interesting. I'm not sure I agree with it, but yeah, it's yeah. it's controversial. The first part I think is is less uh, controversial, but the second book is is kind of going addressing exactly what we're doing. I think it's one of the first efforts to try and, but within the context of reason in a way, still within show the limits of it and how one could transcend it, but in a way that would be very acceptable to the more rational Ryan set. Um, I, I guess what I, I guess why the thing I would point to is that wow. 
the very the very view the reason is what gives us um everything that we can kind of like have shared collective knowledge of and agreement on itself somehow re is a it's a model like maybe the best analogy i can have is like we don't see atoms what we have is like funny enough we live in a real like even the a area that we think is covered by science is basically models of the world that we have more or less like we kind of think like these models predict things that we could then observe and then we agree more but you know like even not quite well, in my lifetime th th they fail to be falsified right the models fail yeah, to be falsified they fail to be false. exactly so they're not necessarily true but they're more like more correct or more likely to be correct in some way you know we have we have probably we have probably distributions over models of the world right uh, of some kind so I guess what I'm saying is that in reason, so let, let's try and think something like, well, let, let's pick another example that I think is really kind of crucial to reason, logic, and the Western tradition that I, I found very interesting, which is we could call it non-duality, or in Western philosophy, it would be the law of the excluded middle. So it seems to me that, let, let's take a classic, a couple of classic areas where this would show up that I think reason really runs into trouble um currently so one is classically like the mind um the mind consciousness problem so I, or the brain like I've, you know i've got this brain the one other thing that most human being i think every human being has this undupital evidence for is they have they are experiencing there is kind of awareness there happening um and some people go are what we call material reductionists they're like no no it's somehow conscious just is your brain but it's like it just seems like really implausibly so like there's there's qualia there's all this experience happening yes it's clearly correlated with your brain like they're clearly like when things happen to your physical brain they impact your experience of reality but it, it really seems i would say and i mean i could go into a lot more detail but it just seems implausible that's reducible to my brain there's something else then it's something that almost all human beings have evidence for that they are is there is awareness that they they are experiencing sounds or sights or smells or thoughts you know things are showing up um and as i want to pick that as one and it's one way where i'd say this non-duality comes up in a dual world i'm either i'm like there's either mind or there's body there isn't some kind of i'm both at the same time or the other classic things about like let's say non-duality is like you know classic things we've got into trouble with is like subject object like either there's a subject observing and there's a reality out there or it's all in my head and it's idealism. And like classically Buddhist or other more non-dual Taoism or other non-dual philosophies, and I'd say this is converging with modern neuroscience in some ways, is like they're kind of both. Like it's not like it's all in my head, but nor is it all out there. Somehow reality is kind of co you know, code what's called in Buddhism codependent arising. There's like an arising mm -hmm. codependently, you know, it's like I, there's an interwovenness of awareness and the world that are kind of kind of somehow coming into being at the same time you know it's like and it's not like i'm just giving these examples where i'd be like hey reason really struggles materialist reductionism really struggles in these kind of really seemingly important areas you know in consciousness research um in, in, in you know i could give some other quite a few other examples but i'm like these are areas where I'm like ah oh, there's something that reason can still talk about reason can still study our brain we can still have philosophical discussions about the consciousness problem and it's really valuable um and um there's something that reason can only touch or point to you know in the way that that but there's a famous phrase like you know my buddha says my teachings are a finger pointing at the moon they are not the moon don't confuse my teachings to what i'm pointing to similarly there are things that we can point to in poetry in science we kind of know it there, like we all know consciousness is there, but it's not going to be kind of explainable in the sense by reason or reducible to in some way reason. Yes, I mean, this certainly confounded like 18th century philosophers who had a lot of problems with sort of mind body dualism. But I think in a modern neuroscience perspective, like you can view the mind, like I could think of, and I'm just broadly my speaking my view is that like consciousness is a community of minds that each of us exists in each other's thoughts. Like, and this is supported by a lot of evidence that we have like mirror neurons where you can like emulate the minds of other humans in your mind. And there's some mirror conception neurons. that like, yeah, that we're, 
you know, interconnected beings. And this obviously goes back to like Buddhist conception of like uh, dependent origination. And like, I don't see those two as being incompatible with each other. Right. You know, more than that, it's more because I would say that just to, to be clear here, I'm trying to distinguish. It's a bit so because I, in distinguishing, I kind of create a separation that may not be there. But let's say there's body, there's mind, there's my thoughts, yeah. but there's an observer of my thoughts. Right. Even my thoughts and my 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 words and my experience show up in some kind of space that is kind of where do the quality come? Right. Like even my words, you know, when you, you hear your thoughts in your mind or you shuff shows up it's like there is another space that is because that's the whole the whole kind of like then consciousness problem right the whole the whole problem of like hey it's not just my brain it's like there's a kind of some intersection it's clearly connected it's clearly like when you do stuff to my brain it affects certainly my thinking or my perceiving but it's not i don't think that is just your awareness i'm just giving an example where that that's that's something that you know, you can do, you know, Buddha's famous point is also you can just be an empirical phenomenologist in the sense of you can just go and do investigate your experience. You can do meditation. For example, Buddhists and many other traditions claim if you do enough meditation, enough kind of the right kind of training, you can enter a space where there's just pure awareness, where thoughts and perceptions have ceased, yet there is awareness still there. Now, if you can do that and enough people do that, you'd create evidence, collective evidence amongst enough people for like, oh, yeah like there is this kind of this this claim about the nature of being is true um and just to take an example i grew up thinking i was my thoughts for a large part of my life i thought i rufus is his thoughts and what is his body and then there's a point where i was like well maybe you know like i've got a fingernail here i've got a fingernail it's part of my body but you could my fingernail could go away and i'd still be there and you know I could do that experiment with more and more parts of my body and I could do it even with, you know, parts of my thinking and there's still something there. And now it might, you might not be Rufus in some way, whatever we're calling Rufus, but there's something there. And I'm just giving an example where that, that investigation, I can talk about it like I can with you, but it transcends. I can still kind of almost get agreement. People can, there can be a shared sense of what I'm talking about, but it's not something that may be completely reducible or explainable in reason. Do you see what I'm getting at? Phrase like that you could have complete awareness and this is true. The word true is doing a lot of work in that sentence because like, I'm not sure like what's this true with me when you're describing, you're trying to describe like the substructure of qualia, which I agree. There could be some massive amount of like internal structure to the qualia of human consciousness that we can explore. But saying that any aspect of that is true I'm not sure that that means anything in that sort of context, because I don't think. Well, so what I'm saying is, I don't think I can actually provide, let's take a, let's take a related argument. So I'm arguing that this, this investigation of, which is what a lot of right religious traditions, but particularly the more mystical, we might call it religious traditions, yeah. whether it's Christianity, uh, Sufism, in Buddhism and Taoism and Zen, um, they being why I like Buddhism is he's kind of saying, Buddha's kind of saying to me, don't believe it. This is not a faith-based religion. Do not come and go like, oh, because I've told you. He's like, go and investigate. And the argument is that you can go and do this investigation. And I think you can discover consonants in a sense of like, oh, wow, what I am discovering when I go and look at the nature of my mind or the nature and the nature of my being of being it's similar to what other people seem to say. So maybe this is like a truth in the sense of like, this is something about the nature of reality, um, but it's not one that I'll be able to like prove in the same way in a laboratory, for, just because it's related to my entire, or my, but also maybe everyone else's internal, I don't want to say internal, because it sounds like internal external, but my internal state. And just to take that a step further, if that were so, for example, if I am not my thoughts, I have thoughts, definitely I have thoughts, but I'm not just my thoughts. I'm not Rufus the mind thinking. That has like quite of important implications for our worldview and then it has implications for polit politics. So just to kind of take it is like Buddhist, uh, Buddha's kind of argument about the four noble truths, he didn't call them like the four noble opinions, was that if you go and do this empirical, like I would call it like empirical phenomenology, if you go and become a phenomenologist, and do the investigation yourself, you will discover that his claims about how suffering arises, how you can transcend it are true. And that 
the, I think this kind of comes to another point, which is that in a future world, we have a belief at the moment of truth claims of things we can prove objectively, whatever that means. We should investigate what independent of the mind. Yeah. Well, in the, yeah, but that's kind of weird because it, what is, I, I know what you're getting yeah. at. Talking you know, about the mind, independent of the mind, it's like I, I know, internal I, contradictions, I, right? Yeah. What I'm getting is that some of the more interesting truths of our world might not be like that, but they still might be more than just opinions. Um, because I am like, just say, I don't mean, I mean, I am skeptical of like, I may be wrong, but I'm not, I'm not, I don't believe in a classic Judeo Christian God, for example, you know, and some people do. Um, but the, the thing I'm trying to get at though is in the Buddhist sense, it's like, oh, we can do this empirical phenomenology. And it would pretty, like, you know, if it's, if these claims about attachment are true, they would um, suggest a lot of stuff about how we can actually make our society weller and wiser because it'd be like, oh, we should really train these capacities and the skills. So, you know, we should have everyone do lots of mindfulness or meditation because this actually is a way to train these capacities or skills that are hard to discover. Now, we can get kind of trivial traces of them in MRI machines. We can see, oh, if people do lots of meditation, their default mode network is less active and stuff like that. You know, we can have these correlations, but it's kind of like, how do I put it? It's a very, it's a very thin gruel compared to the actual phenomenological experience. And I'm trying to point out that there could be something that's not just like my opinion or that I saw a ghost, that somewhere between classical, we can do empirical science about it, that everyone can see the scanner machine and, you know, look at the output from the data and so on. But it's also not simply like, oh, it was, I saw a ghost and it's just what I experienced and who can invalidate it. That there's, there's some kind of like place in between that might be might be might be really important about understanding the nature of reality and therefore how we run society there's not other actually i could disagree with i mean like i think i'm getting down to like really really wonky kind of like epistemology things here but i think there can be justified beliefs about qualia i just don't think there can be justified true beliefs about qualia um, especially about consciousness, because I think having a justified true belief about quality of consciousness would involve a truth about it that would independent of the mind. So I think the statement that there is a truth value about it, the quality of mind is self-contained a logical contradiction that you right. can't have opinions outside of the mind about the mind. Yeah. So I think it's like a girdles kind of paradox kind of thing. Um, but, wait, but, but, wait, you, but wait one moment. The odd thing is, you know that there is something odd about the mind in that it can watch like you have an experience sometimes where you can see you can see your thoughts right there's some space in which this is all kind of arising so there's something there where there is something that this is my point by the way just to go back one of the points is that in the west we're obsessed with paradoxes are bad um dual not non-duality isn't allowed right like i'm not both that i'm not i'm not I'm in here and reality's out there. If I start to say things like I'm out here, like I'm out here, which is a classic like non-dual, you know, at least kind of people into non-dual traditions really go into it. It's like, they are somehow out here. Um, that doesn't mean that they're like, it doesn't mean they're like smudged out with all of reality, but there's somehow a way. And so I'm just trying to get out that one of the things is the law of the excluded middle, i.e. something can't be both true and false. You know, it's either one or the other is, I think in some crucial areas, like a mistake like things can be true and false at the same time you know and fam famously you point out girdle's point but what girdle showed was that in mathematics there are that well they're not things that are necessarily true well there are things that are potentially true and false or that are true but can't be proved and so on you know and so even in this kind of very precise logical area we have things that sort of transcend these categories that we've created I mean, we could do that in logic as well. I mean, like you can have like paraconsistent logics where you actually reject the law of the excluded middle, uh, but you allow, or sorry, you reject the principle of explosion, which says that you can derive anything from the conjunction of a statement with its contradiction, right? And that allows you to have statements which can be neither true nor false. And like you can derive actually a logic based on that. And actually, there's actually some interesting work about like paraconsistent logic and Buddhist logic, actually, which is very interesting. Um, so like, I mean, it's entirely possible to talk about that experience of like rejecting duality and rejecting the law of the excluded middle from a rationalist framework though as well, right? Because obviously our logical system is itself based on 
axioms and you can like permute the axioms and derive different systems. And some of them are consistent and Gödel proved that uh, no so consistent, no uh, formal axiomatic system capable of expressing arithmetic is capable of proving all statements mm -hmm. within its own context, right? Um, yes. <laughs> somebody will call me out for the yeah, we'll badly we'll phrased we'll reading of that, but, <laughs> but yeah, okay. but, but to, but back to political philosophy though. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that the, the experiences of qualia are actually quite interesting, but I think that they're definitely demarcated from reason and that they can both be interesting topics to talk about, but I think there is a kind of um, incommensurability in talking about them within the same framework. And people can have their descriptions about qualia and like you can think that the Buddhist conception of like the Four Noble Truths uh, yeah. could actually be truths within that framework, but they're truths in a different sense that like, you know, Fermat's last theorem is true. And I think right. that's not incompatible with each other. Well, well, I think I think that's a great point. And that what I'm trying to get at, therefore, is that just as at a certain point in maybe the last age that we were in, and I mean this like crudely, you know, but there was a, a kind of cultural ontological system. There was a point where we had to kind of break out you know, so to think back, if you were in a system where God, there are these, you know, God knows the universe, think, you know, even, you know, et cetera, et cetera. The way we're in now of rationality and reason would just seem kind of like, wow, that, you know, we really broke out of, of, a, of, a, of a structure. And I guess that's what I'm wondering about is to say, and, and I, maybe it's helpful to try and think of how that cashes out in terms of political philosophy. You know, what, what does it mean that you would believe these things? So maybe I can try to point to a couple of areas. So when when you go down the rationalist route you you have certain problems i think that are that show up let me name a couple of them so one is i think the magic going out of the world in weber's famous phrase so when you go down the rational route like what happens is like it's this kind of it's an acid that kind of eats away at the magic of things things get there's a, te there's a tendency that you end up in a kind of reduction, materialist reductionist world where you're like, we're just all just atoms bumping into atoms. We're just like the selfish genes. You know, there's this kind of, the, the, the meaning and the kind of richness of the world is somehow lost. Now, the rationalist reduction said, well, look, tough titty, that's just what's so, you know, face it up, enjoy life that there is, you know, whatever. It doesn't make sense that you even have qualia, but hey, you do just, you know, but there's something that's really, really there. And that, I think that shows up in the anime um, the, the meaning crisis, the, the depression that we see, like, you know, and, and that what people are left with in terms of, let's say, a religion or alternative is either left with a, like a reactionary religion. They, I, I mean, I don't know if I'm not, but, you know, they go back to something from the past that's almost pre enlightenment. But there's not a lot going forward in the rationalist model. There's not, there's not a lot of like, you know, be, you know, richer belief system to give meaning to life, to explain why you have ethics, why you don't behave selfishly. You know, there's a reason we end up with Wall Street. You know, there's there's a kind of, you know, I think sometimes we're almost living on the fumes of the Reformation. And then if that weren't there, you know, with the hyper capitalist individual society would be even like kind of more um, black mirror than it is. Yeah. You know, um, so I think that there's there's so there's one that's a problem, which is I think for rationalism, which is like hey, there's a kind of meaning crisis inherent in it. There's an ethical crisis inherent in it in some way. Um, you know, there isn't a lot of reason why you would treat other people well other than like, oh, it's it's kind of efficient to cooperate in the prisoner's dilemma some of the time. Whereas I think there are much deeper reasons we want to cooperate and much more kind of profound callings to, to, to be loving and kind to each other. The second, I think, problem of rationality, and this is one that's kind of also very visible and maybe more attractive because more empirical, is the climate crisis. So I think that the reductionist materialist view, um, you know, has a, has a problem and it kind of leads to markets and so on, which is that it kind of sees nature starting to be exploited. And you see this in, by the way, both communism, and capitalism, this isn't specific to capitalism, but in modernity, there's generally like a sense of nature is this thing that we're given dominion over. It goes back to Christianity, sure, but there's this kind of sense that 
we're there, you know, we can do what we want with it. The other aspect about it is that we overrate our ability to understand ecosystems. We underestimate the limits of rationality. Now, of course, we can say really good rational people would know about, you know, externalities and they would know about the limits of markets and they would know that there are things that can't be measured and they would get that there's a problem with GDP that basically, um, you know, going to a prostitute adds to GDP, but, but making love to your wife doesn't, um, you know, like, <laughs> They would get these things are a problem, but the thing is, it it's kind of like it's kind of like saying that oh, in Catholicism you understood there was some some errors at the edge or some things that were a bit problematic about you know like you know there was a problem of why is there evil in the world if God is all good and all powerful you know there, there were kind of things at the edge, but I think these things are not just things you can patch in rationality. I think they're quite inherent in the materialist rationalist model because it's kind of rationality leads to materialism which kind of leads to reductionism which leaves you with this these kind of challenges so i just want to i wonder i mean i'm sure you've got a response but like maybe start with the climate crisis you know a lot of people just sit here and say look modernity gave us the climate crisis you know um other ways of seeing the world like whether they're indigenous or they're taoist or whatever would would have treated the world differently the natural world and we are we see ourselves as separate as to exploit it and and are also our rationals kind of growth mindset where we can just we scientifically think we understood the system and so on is is you know is it is it the source of some of these problems what do you think there's two points you made in there and like second one i largely agree with the first one i strongly disagree with actually um that inevitably rationalism leads to this sort of reductive materialism and ultimately nihilism uh i mean no i mean it's largely like we're just atoms the word just is doing a lot of work in that sentence right because like okay yes we are just atoms but like atoms are beautiful like if you look at like there's a Feynman quote he says that you know look at the flower and like the flower is composed of all of these like elaborate structures and proteins and dna and ultimately those reduced down to like you know ultimately quantum field theory which gives rise to this massive amount of you know, chemical structure that arises with these beautiful symmetries between groups. Um, and the and understanding of that only leads to the beauty of the flower, not to a reduction to just being atoms. Like those atoms themselves are beautiful if you understand the entire structure of how existence arises out of it, right? And so like that just adds to your awareness of the world and a greater understanding of things rather than a simplistic viewing that it's just a flower. Like, no, it's a flower plus all of this beautiful structure underlying reality. And so, like, the nihilism arises out of the fact that, like, atoms themselves cannot be beautiful, that material things cannot be intrinsically, you know, beautiful, and that there's this separation between, like, only human experience is has this beautiful conception to it. No, like, math and physics and material world can itself be justified in its own outright existence. Um, and then the second part I largely agree with Um I don't think that, I don't think rationalism inherently is a nihilism, and I don't think that materialism uh, is necessarily like a incompatible with sort of a sense of awe and wonder of the universe. Obviously, right? Um, I think they're fully compatible. But then you know you could say like materialism leads to consumptionism and like crony capitalism and neoliberalism. And yes, you can make that argument, um, and that that gives rise to these massive principal Asian problems, collective action problems, of which the climate crisis is the big one. Um, yeah. So the, qu the question I'm asking though then is why I'm saying it's interesting is that that, so let's just focus on the second one. Yeah. Are there, what, to kind of come back to this point in the pragmatic utopianist essay is that if we, that, so claim one, which we're kind of agreeing on, is that somehow our way of seeing the world and thinking about the world, like these kind of core assumptions like rationalism and reason, are somehow really bound up in this unfolding crisis or problem. And then my claim two would be to say, so which, which you know, is a second, is a distinct claim, is that if we, there are ways that we could transform our way of seeing the world i.e. our kind of cultural or ontological views that would make a really big difference and perhaps the are even the are kind of as, as certainly necessary if not sufficient conditions for addressing powerfully this this crisis so specifically it might be like ah in this rational world this kind of like 
embedded in it, there's a kind of sense of uh, an over maybe blown sense of control. There's this materialism. And that if we went to a super rational model, for example, uh, what, which would maybe, you know, what would that mean? That might be included, like seeing myself as somehow more interwoven with the world, more in a sense of interbeing with other human beings, with what well, then you could frame those, as you said, even our mind is intermingling with others. You know, you could try and fit this in a rationalist, rationalist framework. And I think we could start by doing that, by the way, because that's the way out. But in a way, it will take you somewhere, what I would call super rational. You include the rational, but there's a somehow a richer understanding of our of our place in the natural world, our connection to ecosystems, our way, a greater humility maybe about our level of understanding of the way the natural world and, and we ourselves work and so on. You know, as I said, we don't need to frame it if that's unhelpful, super rational. Maybe we're saying it's like an extension of rationality, but certainly there's some kind of significant shift in how we understand ourselves and our place in the world and our connection with nature could be like a really important part of addressing the climate crisis or the other collective action problems we might face. Actually, there's a lot that actually I agree with. Like, I think the problems you're describing arise out of philosophy I would call like primitive dualism that like I exist independent of my mind and that I exist independent of the rest of culture. And I think that's, those are fundamentally false assumptions that we both can probably agree on. Like I am a, a product of everybody that I've been around me. Right. And that like that kind of primitive duality gives rise to the idea of like neoliberalism and the kind of destructive forces in capitalism that we see today that are giving rise to things like the climate crisis. Um, and I can get behind that and maybe incorporating I would say not super rational, but I, I reject that term, um, but like a description of the qualias that give rise to a description of the ego in terms of not being an independent entity could maybe be a way to deconstruct primitive duality for some people. And that's definitely something that would be interesting to explore. And I think that's largely true. Like if you were to basically just like, I don't know, uh, dose your average like you know econ you know chicago style economics conference with acid and like <laughs> would that actually produce like a, bit, a greater understanding of the world for everybody who thought that they were all connected with each other like would that actually you know <laughs> give rise to greater understanding maybe uh <laughs> it's a thought experiment i think it's a, it, it, well exactly so that's one i mean i know we we're saying it's a joke it's a good it's a good point and i think um Yeah, well, I mean, first, yeah, really, really agree. So what we quite call primitive dualism is 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 a, an error. And I think that maybe you were pointing at something when even the joke about people taking, uh, about the guy taking acid is that the thing that's, that's interesting is um, how, you know, often the things we believe, I think are rarely actually directly come to you through reason. You know, the, what, what's so powerful about the experience of, let's say, acid for someone is that it's very like it's very like here, you know, it's like it, it's not it's not even very capturable in words, but it's yet unarguably often very powerful for the people who experience or take ayahuasca or take some other thing and that, that it really shifted. What I've also found fascinating, though, and I want to come back to this as a subtle kind of point below about political philosophy is that I've also noticed the resilience of people to revert. When let's say someone has some powerful experience, maybe maybe through psychedelics, it might be through um, just I don't know going out in nature and having some very profound experience of awe and and wonder. Um, you know, it might happen out of religion, a religious experience. It might happen out of meditation, or the reason, or of reason. It might there might there might be something out of, out of mathematics. You know, many many exactly. of the very great scientists had you know a wonder at the kind of like just infinite complexity of the universe. Um, what is odd, though, I also noticed, is that for some people, that insight somehow is sustained into their life. It, it, it changes how they engage with the world. Um, but for many people, it doesn't. I mean, I, let me give an example. I spoke to someone yesterday, actually, who was like, he graduated from like a top college, you know, top university. He really, His dream, he was an engineer. He wanted to be, he went to work for Formula One racing team. That was his whole dream. And at some point, he had this like quite profound crisis Somehow it was like a kind of dark night. First of all, kind of got depressed, but then started like meditating. And he was just like, 
you just had this kind of major switch it was like wow i just really you know it's not that i i, I still go on being an engineer or something but I, I really need to leave this world and somehow the energy and i, I you know we often did a lot of meditation but what i'm getting at that person kind of switched but i you know there's many people who somehow have these experiences and this comes back to this cultural thing of like why even have this discussion and have this kind of um i don't know if we will put you know this podcast or this or the sharing is that that those beliefs um aren't you know pe people seem to have these insights but then they don't state does not become trait it doesn't change into ways of seeing the world that shift kind of broadly you know that um you you know i i often joke i want to get a t-shirt printed saying i am not my thoughts um you know and you know you talk about the nihilism point I can show you an essay I wrote when I was 17 or 18 at school where I it was I was a fully card carrying nihilist and not because I wanted to be, but I had I really went through the logic. I was like, okay, you know, I'm not religious because it just doesn't make any sense and that reason doesn't work. And basically there's no point to react, there's no point to life. Um, you know, um and, and other than maybe to be happy, but if I'm not happy, you know, you're in this loop of contradiction because you know you're not happy. But it's like I was really lost. And I think that while maybe you have quite a you know like you're quite nourished by rationality i would i would say that if we went out and talked to people i think there's you know on this point of like the impact of it on people you know as i said max weber you know the great sociologist you know, he talked about the disenchantment with the world that came out of the rational society and i think that that's that's there and and, and it's it's importance is that it it reinforces a resignation to the status quo. So from a political perspective and from a, like a social perspective, we're talking on this podcast, but seemingly people, you know, we can't go, A, we don't dose to Chicago's profession. And even if we did, if they went back to the faculty with all the other Chicago school economists, they'd probably revert or they'd quit, you know? <laughs> um, and, and so the, the question then becomes like, that I'm then interested in, like, and it comes back to evolution versus revolution. The first point we started this podcast on is how does, this change happen if even let's say we agree let's whether we come from a different perspective but like hey primitive duality is a mistake let's call it that um there's a much richer view of human human society and nature in which we're richly interwoven and we're interwoven with with kind of nature and that would imply a level of kind of caring um a level of 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 love even you could say a level of um awe and presence that would really shift our way of acting and attitude in the world. The question I then have is how does that come about in society? Because we kind of currently, I wouldn't say that's the dominant mentality right now in our societies of, of hope, because even also that implies hope, by the way. Whereas I what I often see is quite a lot of resignation or Absolutely. cynicism or hopelessness. You know, or even like, I don't like neoliberalism, but we can't really do better. Or there's some people who are even like freaking like choir boys for neoliberalism. But, you know, what do you then see? It's like, how do we evolve to that? You know, how how do we not, you know, how do we, when it's the stickiness of a given way of being, how do we get to this society to switch or shift gradually by evolution or by a revolution to this different way of seeing? I think a lot of the inability to, to conceive of the, the water that we swim in is through the fact that like the great mass of men just leave lives of quiet desperation, that people are not living in a state of abundance where they can even conceive of or have this kind of conversation about like the primacy of being versus the primacy of reason. This is a very like the height of privilege to be able to even sit here and talk about this kind of stuff at the level that like we're both like grossly overread and highly educated, but like most humanity throughout human history has not been like this, right? Yeah. So in some sense, like, you know, this is this is privilege of the highest order to even be able to talk about this stuff, but it's a growing pool of people that are able to even talk about this stuff to experience things outside of their own ego, either through reason or through alternative means or uh, through spirituality. And um, I think you're getting on something that, like, yeah, we should have a way to conceive of alternative. Yeah, I mean, the problem, maybe this is like what Nietzsche's critique of modernity was, that like basically like uh, in the absence of, you know, religion and sort of organized sense making we're just going to send into nihilism and that it should be the goal of us to like transcend the nihilism and find meaning and purpose so one framework i guess but uh and nietzsche wasn't he was onto something there and that probably describes a lot of the modern condition uh because i i definitely see even with our own 
like people I know are largely either cynical about the future or they've sent it into complete nihilism. Like there's yes. no hope, like that nihilism is the problem of our era. I, I would, yes, I know so many people that are absolutely not, especially about climate crisis these days. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, I don't have the answers to that, unfortunately, though. <laughs> but maybe there are, maybe there are answers. Well, wait, but it comes back because you sent me an excerpt from the kind of wolf books. I think, so I think there are certain things that make a difference. So first of all, like hope, hope is, is one of the classic examples maybe of a collective action uh, problem or opportunity from, from a cultural point of view. Hope is contagious, just as despair is. And I think one of the things that why 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 it can seem like all very privileged, very abstract. I think this 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 the things we're discussing cash out in something very concrete, which is hope and faith. Because the issue that we have, just to go back, I didn't maybe frame that to be in a series. It's, the issue that I think many people see is the current system is not working. Well, they start to see that. Um, but if you see that, but there's no alternative, what do you end up in? Is clearly nihilism. The system's not working, but there's no, you know, we, yeah. you know, and, and therefore giving up. What we're trying to do in this in this discussion, or for me, is to point out that there is a path. And why we have to just go through that in quite a lot of detail is traditionally people have, unfortunately, there was the death of God, you know, but then there was the death of socialism. Now that, but that was also maybe, maybe that was great. Like obviously Marx Conium didn't go so well, I, I would say. I know there are people who might disagree and we could discuss that, but in my view, it didn't go so well. And the thing is people are stuck in either they either now have they think structural solutionism didn't work which i think they'd largely write about that on its own it's not a work i oh if we reorganize the ownership or even today they're like oh we could tweak redistribution a bit and i think those things i'm not saying they're not that a little bit valuable but they're not really going to cut it right like you know or like oh i don't know about people assume like climate crisis we're going to like somehow you know solve it with a bit more solar or something like people know there's something deeper is needed and what we're trying to set out here is to say ah you know, we're not, you know, rehashing Marxism, which didn't work, because the issue people have is they don't see a path forward. So that's what I'm just trying to come back is if the great thing of our time is the nihilism, it's the combination of seeing that something is not working and yet seeing no alternative. And it, that dictatorship of no alternative, to borrow Roberta Unger's phrase here, is, is very powerful. You know, the greatest trick the capitalism ever pulled was persuading you that nothing else exists. Like, you know, the greatest trick the devil ever pulled was persuading he didn't exist. So like this point that in this scene was setting out there is a path that these kind of beliefs, seeing primitive duality, seeing that there is uh, a diff, that we are different from that is the beginning of a kind of connection. And out of those kind of, that way of seeing comes maybe organizing, comes political action comes these things that can lead to the evolution if we don't like revolution which i agree with but can lead to quite rapid change and i and i i mention this in the sense that 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 happened maybe on a scale of centuries but that happened the last time it would have been unbelievable at the moment of the peasants result and i'm going to get the date wrong but i think the late 13th century really uh, yeah i'm check i should check my dates the peasants revolt quickly um uh which took place when 1380 sorry i'm 1381 right that uh, the end of the terrible 14th century right the black death european famine failed harvest but 1381 they executed people hung drawn quarter the leaders for saying basically we want equality you know when eve span when adam delved and eve span who was then the gentleman was their song right okay they were executed in 1789. Well, we don't like the French Revolution, but any well, we at least like, you know, maybe the British Revolution, which was less bloody or something, but you know, <laughs> the Glorious Revolution. Uh, Burke, Burke would have liked the Glorious Revolution, um, 1688. We got equality. So I'm trying to say here is that, that we are sending all of this out, not just because we're privileged, but because this kind of viewpoint, which also shows up for the like poorest monks in the world who have nothing, who are, you know, these kind of views actually permeate in many places. There's something that gives hope that there is a path forward towards a pragmatic utopia and pragmatic in the sense that there are concrete evolutionary steps to it. It doesn't involve us having to kill all the nobles or something. It involves, but it does involve us seeing, conceiving ourselves, our place in the world and the world differently and then acting from that in a different way. Would, and, and as I said, hope can catch fire. 
yeah, I think maybe this is a good place to kind of wrap up our conversation about this stuff. And like, I totally agree with the idea that like, yeah, uh, phrasing hope as a collective action problem is actually kind of a very profound statement. I like that quite a bit, actually. Because like, going back to like the beginning of the conversation about like science fiction, like even our like literature is descended into like dystopian nihilism these days. Like an Ian Banks would never get published today because like his view would be so out of step with modernity. And yes. like, even look at like what Star Trek has become in recent, it's become descended into nihilism. Like our science fiction like glorifies dystopias now. <laughs> and uh, we can't even like conceive of like, you know, utopian futures anymore. And, you know, I, I want to, you know, I don't like dystopian science fiction, to be frank. Actually, I find like a bunch of the kind of the Neil Stephensons and stuff of the world, like they're creating horrible, horrible visions of the future, which a lot of Silicon Valley leaders are basically now turning into reality. Like, you know, you know, yes. describing the torment vortex is the joke, right? You know, don't make the torment vortex. And then you know, Mark Zuckerberg we released the torment vortex, right? And the nihilism of our science fiction is actually turning into reality. So actually, maybe that's kind of the, the broad overarching thing, was it like, our conceptions of idealized utopias can actually manifest in reality because science fiction oftentimes informs what people do with their lives. And well, science fiction is, uh, you know, it's our collective hallucinations about the future that could be. And yeah, uh, what, what we can imagine, we can become. Yes. And yes. therefore, that, and there's that, I think the point you made at the end that, that, the very act, therefore, of also imagining and sharing imagination and positive imagination and utopian vision of the future. And I think the ones which are pragmatic, you know, though, still grounded in how we can get there is profoundly important. I think on that note, we should definitely end. And thank you so much, Stephen. And I, I maybe let's maybe this is the beginning of, uh, of a series of something. So thank you so much. I think we 